Welcome to Green Building Matters, the podcast that matters for green building professionals. Learn insight in green buildings as we interview today's experts in lead and wealth. We'll learn from their career paths, war stories, and all things green, because green building matters. And now our host, and yes, he has every lead and well credential, here's Charlie Cicchetti. Be sure to check out the Green Building Matters community, where you can have unlimited exam prep for any of the professional credential exams you're tackling next, as well as putting your continued education on autopilot, saving time with GBS reporting your hours on your behalf. Check it out, gbes.com slash join. Now, enjoy this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. Usually each week, I'm interviewing a green building professional, taking a look back on their journey, and also fast forwarding to what are they up to today and what's around the corner. Today, I'm joined by a lead fellow, Chad Dorgan. Chad, thanks for being with us. Great to be here. I can't wait to you know learn more about what you're doing as the Vice President of Quality and Sustainability at McCarthy out there in the Orange County area. But I always like to ask my guest, Chad, take us back. So where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school? Well, I actually grew up in Madison, Wisconsin and went to school at Madison. Got my undergraduate in mechanical engineering. And then I spent uh, four years in the Air Force doing uh, base level design. And it was actually Desert Storm 1. Way, way back in the day. After I got out, I got back and I got my doctorate back at uh, Madison again. So I spent quite a bit of time in Madison. Yeah, no, great school. I saw uh, the PhD there. That's amazing. And uh, first, thank you for your service. Uh, appreciate that. You're welcome. So mechanical engineering, you know, when I'm reading through your bio, engineering, engineering, commissioning, then construction. So piece a little bit of that together. I mean, you just always wanted to get onto the mechanical engineering side of things. I guess I can... Uh, credit my dad or blame my dad for that one. He was an account <laughs> engineer and just always kind of was interested in it and was involved in the family business since I grew up. But I got into it just was naturally uh, drawn to the complexity of the systems and just how hard it was to get them actually to work, but also how important it was for comfort and then indoor air quality. And probably what led me towards the sustainability side was just all the impact, you know, that fairly hidden system has on people that people really don't know how to get to work right and to make it sustainable and, and effective. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. And that's kind of the follow-up there is when did you become kind of sustainable minded? Was there an aha moment? Did you maybe grow up uh, with some of it uh, or did you, you know, maybe after college and as you're getting into your career, like, you know what, I, w- I want to do more of this. So what was it for you? I don't think it was an aha we grew up during the 70s, during the kind of first energy crisis where you couldn't drive around the country. And mm. it was just kind of lived that. And I was like, didn't want to do that again. So I, I, I guess I didn't go to the first green build. I went to the second green build. And it was just like a small group, but really excited to do something different. And it was just like, you know, this it, it just kind of made sense that this was going to be a natural evolution of where we had to go, you know, get away from codes and standards and and make it, I don't want to say more sexy, but make it something that people want to do because it's the right thing. Mm. Uh, that's necessary. You know, it's not just, yeah. a business, it's, you know, we got to still convince a lot of people out there and educate and what are our options even today. Uh, so let, let's talk about the career a little bit. Uh, mentors, you, you mentioned your dad there. Uh, did anyone else have some influence, maybe open some doors for you along the way? Oh, various various people. I'd say my doctor is actually into air quality. So, you know, Jim Woods way back in the day out of um, Virginia was instrumental and just kind of get me excited about indoor air quality and, and what it really meant. Had a lot of mentors in the Air Force, just more on the uh, leadership side that, that drove me to you know, kind of step up and, and take leadership positions as as I, I saw. And then tons of people within ASHRAE also through the commissioning side that, you know, kind of showed the path of, of where I had to go and kind of what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. And, and for those listening, you know, we say it a few times here on the podcast, but your trade organizations, you got to double down on those like ASHRAE. So if you're an engineer, Chad, it, it sounds like ASHRAE has been very good for you. And I'm sure you've volunteered over the years with ASHRAE, but just a great trade organization to, to stay in touch with and, and volunteer, get on committees, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I did everything at the local level up to president and, you know, did a lot of uh, different positions on research and programs at the, the national level. And, yeah, I mean, I look at it, it's, it's basically free training for people and how to manage others, but also how to collaborate and how to come to consensus on really what, what has to get done. It's a lot of times slow process, but to me, it's very rewarding that, you know, you can see tangible results at the back end of it. Excellent career advice. Uh, some free training there. So help me piece together. Then you went a lot into commissioning, right? You're working on all kinds of different systems. If I understand your background, uh, pretty heavy commissioning for a while. Is, uh, tell us a little bit about that time. Yeah, so after Air Force, I basically went back and took over the, the family company and did 12 years of building commissioning. Really started at the infancy of it. You know, I'll credit my dad. He was pioneer in, in commissioning and started guideline zero and guideline one. So that's kind of where I learned everything I know from. But, you know, that it was kind of fun in the early years where you really just had to break the ground and get owners to you know, see a different way to plan and execute their projects and get them to adopt this new thing called commissioning, which was to me essentially just a quality process for them to plan and execute their projects. And you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, I don't know, I guess more of the soft skills you learn there on how to convince architects and contractors and owners who have you know, done something the same way for 50, 100 years that, hey, there's a better way. And kind of parallels to what the same discussion will lead is, you know, we've done it this way forever. Why should we change? And all those soft skills are just as important as the, the technical skills of how you do things. Oh, yeah. No, I absolutely agree. Let's talk about commissioning for a minute before we move on is uh, for those listening, you know, a lot of them uh, understand lead and that there's a prerequisite for at least fundamental commissioning and maybe optional points for enhanced. And, and now we're even more moving towards envelope commissioning. But, you know, I'm sure a lot of the projects you've worked on are not necessarily just lead projects. Really, every new construction project should do fundamental commissioning. Right, Chad? Uh, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Um, what have you seen there over those years you did all that commissioning? Yeah, I mean, it, it's simply put, you know, commissioning is helping an owner understand and document their requirements, their, their owner requirements. And then throughout the process, you know, I think the, the, the pre-commissioning way we did things, well, we, we would identify the requirements and then do a design, then hand it off to the contractor and then hand it off to the, to the operators. And it's like throwing a bunch of stuff over the wall. And really what commissioning does is, those owner requirements, it keeps that focus throughout the entire process. Are we still meeting what the owner wanted? <laughs> Keep them engaged in making those decisions. So, you know, I, I think a very simple way to think about it is commissioning managers' expectations that you have the owner that they want this at the beginning, and at the end, they're disappointed because they didn't get what they thought they were going to get. And commissioning is the way that. We're able to have those discussions, and at the end, expectation matches reality. Uh, a lot of detail goes into that and a lot of effort to do that, but in the end, it, it's getting everyone engaged and collaborating that we got success. And you know, it's uh, fun to do, hard to do, but in the end, when you look at it, uh, it if people moving into the building get that what they expected. They're happier. They're more productive. The building just works better because people are working with it better. And it's not necessarily that it was a better building. It's just they know what they got. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I... I always like to just kind of double down on what you just said is, you know, it's it's a second set of eyes for the owner. We're going to make sure what the designers designed is what the contractors install is running the right way day one might. But I think you're right. A lot of a lot of owners really even need to know what they have and did it meet those early project requirements. So what are some of the harder systems to commission? Is it renewables? Is it radiant equipment? I'm just curious. Well, traditionally, it's been daylighting. It's just been a oh, the daylight. challenging system to get it really working where it's not noticeable. And a, a lot of times, it, I'd say put a little bit less control than over control because if the lights are constantly changing, I think people notice it more than if there's a gradual change. Yes. Um, it's gotten better in the last probably five years or so, but it's always been a, a tough system to, to get going. And I'd say, you know, the, the biggest transition in, in buildings the last 10 years has just been the of low voltage systems. You know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was doing design, we had maybe one or two low voltage systems. Recent hospital we just finished, we had 60 independent low voltage systems. We had to, 
you know, design and stuff all get started up and they all had to kind of work together. So it's getting much more complicated to get these buildings to work. Yeah. It's making your job a lot harder there. And, uh, Gosh, well, I want to ask a little bit about, okay, now how'd you make the jump from commissioning to McCarthy? And you've been there for over 14 years. McCarthy, very well-respected company on the construction side. So tell us a little bit about what brought you to McCarthy and what you've been up to there. I think ultimately it was just um, opportunity, a bigger influence, a bigger change that, you know, in my, in my own company, you know, I could influence 10, 20 projects, maybe five owners a year. And it just, you know, it wasn't getting to the critical mass. And, you know, every time I'd go to a new general contractor, it was like reselling them. It's like, well, what's your process? What do you do? And I just kept finding that GCs didn't have good quality processes. They were always responding to, you know, contract requirements or what what the core required on a, you know, an army project, things like that. But they, they didn't like internalize, this is our quality program. So the opportunity came where I saw McCarthy was looking for that position. And after quite a long interview and back and forth process, so like, you know, I, I can make a difference here and I can, you know, take everything I've learned from both design and operation and cons- and commissioning and you know, change an organization for the better. That's so cool. And your title, Chad, help me. It's uh, both quality and sustainability. So how, how do those maybe go hand in hand and what you do on the, with your construction company? Well, the, Put in mind to both change management. You know, you're you're trying to do things right the first time, and if if you expand the definition of right to you know right for the environment, right for us, and you know McCarthy is a community based builder. We we live where we build, so we we want to make sure that what we do, you know, is is helping the community too. So to me do it right the first time is, is both a, a quality mantra, but also a sustainability mantra. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I like doing what's right there. And Are there any projects uh, you could talk about? What's keeping you busy today? Oh, we got a lot of, a lot of hospital work. I'd say those, those are some of the biggest ones. We're wrapping up the BSL-4 lab, which is, if you ever watch sci-fi movies, it's space suit labs where you go and get locked in. Uh, so that's a fun one. And we were also on a joint venture with Mortensen uh, building Raiders Stadium in Vegas. So that's a massive project uh, going forward. So a lot, lot of variety, you know, they, they all have, well, not maybe lead, they all have green elements and requirements and, you know, different definitions by owners and just how you meet it and how you drive it is, is unique for every project. Yeah, it absolutely is. Those are some uh, awesome projects and very different, uh, I'm sure different requirements, different needs. Uh, I think before we got on the podcast interview, we both agreed it's just so busy right now. A lot of, a lot yeah. of good projects, a lot of good work out there. Uh, well, you know, this is a tricky question because it's a humbling one. What are some of your proudest achievements, Chad? Uh, heck of a career here. You know, you're, you're the guy in this space. So, I don't know, not just business, even personal. What are what are one or two things that stand out, some of your proudest achievements? Um, probably say three. Um, you know, back back in the day when I was doing commissioning, I also did uh, what we call applied research for ASHRAE. So the company, we did some design guides for ASHRAE. And, you know, just I think the one on absorption cooling, it was, you know, taking all that history of, 40 years of absorption cooling that kind of died off, then how do you utilize that with thermal storage? And it was kind of connecting dots, but then also it kind of re-energized a, you know, a small industry on, you know, how do we use a technology that's proven that's worked really, really well, but people didn't understand it. So that, that was, was one of the many books I, I did for ASHRAE. I'd say the other one would be, just the ASHRAE guideline zero and one, making it much more functional and much more easy to use by commissioning providers out in the industry and standardizing your own terminology that really wasn't there before those those documents were done. Mm. And then that led to guideline three and a bunch of others that, you know, going to envelope in other areas of commissioning. And then say third, you know, just more on the quality side, you know, when I started my career at McCarthy, I said, I'm not going to be an island. and Part of that is sort of looking out around the, the landscape. And like, there weren't many of us, but there were a few other contractors that had just started their quality programs. And after about five years, I was able to create a construction quality executive council 
we're we're now up to 30 members that are really trying to change the, the whole industry and how we approach quality and design and construction. That's fantastic. Those are incredible accomplishments, literally writing how we do commissioning, how the industry does commissioning and, and more than that. So uh, I've got to highlight though for you is your lead fellow. I mean, one of the early classes of lead fellows, it's a huge deal. You know, for those listening, you can take and pass your lead grant associate, move on to lead AP with a specialty, but you know, this is a peer nominated lead fellow. So Chad, uh, hopefully that really validated all the sustainability work you've been doing, but tell us just a little bit about the lead fellow status. And it, it, it's an honor to get it. It's obviously a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears to, <laughs> to make it to that level, but it, it's nice to be recognized by peers that, that you did make a difference. I think the lead fellow group is is morphing. It's just trying to finally, finally gain us enough uh, critical mass to actually you know, be an organization within the organization. I mean, I'm looking forward to where it's going in the next 10 years as far as, you know, what these senior leaders can continue to mentor and, and drive the organization. You know, we hope we all have a lot of years left on us on, on what we're doing and where we can take uh, sustainability in the industry. Uh, it's great. Now that there's so many lead fellows there, um, all, of, all of you are making a big difference. So this is one of my favorite questions to ask a green building professional like yourself is, if you had a crystal ball... Chad, where is the industry going to be shifting next? What should we be reading up on now? Well, I think there's two there's two main areas that we're going to have to focus on going forward. And I think one is there's a wholesale shift coming to more of the prefabrication of elements. You know, we've already seen small stuff with pipe and duct racks and some walls and things like that. We've started seeing, you know, bathrooms and rooms, but you know, I just think we're going to go more and more towards that manufacturing style for components and assemblies just because it's it's safer, it's quicker, it's more reliable. Um, but also it can, you know, reduce waste and really focus on sustainability at a point versus dispersed across 20 projects. And then I think the, the, the other area that, you know, looking out other at other industries that are non-construction that they're probably a decade ahead of us, but it's going to hit us is supply chains. You know, what is the transparency of that, you know, widget that you're putting in the building? How far back do you know? How, you know, what, what were the labor that built it? What were the materials and all that? And, you know, it just, it hasn't hit our industry to that level, but other industries a lot harder. So eventually it's going to hit us because that, that's, again, the next right thing to do is to have transparency in that supply chain and know what you're actually putting in your building. Uh, this is fantastic. Um, how does a larger construction company like you guys, I mean, is it, it, you know, we have rating systems that sometimes mandate it. We have standards, building codes, but, you know, how do we be an earlier adopter of the supply chain requirements and some prefab uh, with our building components or sometimes entire buildings? Like, you know, is that going to come from, well, where's that going to come from next, do you, would you say? I think a lot of it's just going to be disruptors in the industry. There's a few out there that are starting to do prefab, and it's just it's going to be those pioneers that show the way and, and grow the industry, and then competition will come. Yes. It's, going to start, it's, it's going to start small like it already has, that you know, I'm going to buy 15 partition walls. But then it's going to you know, take a lot of effort on the contract and designer side to know, well, what does that really mean? How do I sequence my work? How do I make sure my floors are, you know, level and flat and that they can actually fit where they're going? So there's no easy button. This is going to change the way we behave, but there's instances out there where it's working. There's a lot of failures out there, and but ultimately it's it's going to be better, cheaper, faster. So we're going to go that way. It's just, we have to. I have to. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, Chad, what are you best at? What's your specialty or gift? I'd say it's kind of looking at the landscape and really seeing what's working, what's not working, and then changing the direction of where we're going. So it's, it's seeing, seeing the, the, the tree in the forest and saying, well, that, that's what we got to do and, and get past all the clutter. I love it. So I've got to have a follow-up question there, though, is how can those that maybe aren't as good at that learn to say no to certain things so they can chase that? Uh, that gut feeling, that's where we need to go. So any tips, I, I have to assume maybe you have to say no to a lot of things so that you can focus on on that. So any, any tips on saying no or, or just knowing when to trust your gut on those those decisions? You know, it's a little of both, but a lot of times, you know, I, I use a lot of data 
in in my at least my quality program to know where to focus. So, you know, you you got to figure out where you're bleeding first, then go after that, and that that will be a different discussion based on each company. But you know, talk to your peers, talk to your leaders. You know, do do some surveys. You know, wherever it takes, but then you know, use the tools available to you to figure out where that focus needs to be, and then prioritize like like we do on you know, any performance plan. But I think a lot of times we're 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 trying to take everything on, but we're not quite sure how that aligns with where we need to go. So I, so I spend a lot of time on that front end and make sure I'm going to where I need to go before I go. I guess maybe the best way to say it. Yeah, calculated risk, use the data. I love it. Thank you for those pro tips. Uh, the next one, kind of rapid fire here is, uh, Chad, do you have any routines or rituals that help you stay successful on point and any good habits in there you can share with us? You, you got to set time aside or put on the calendar for key things you need to do. And, you know, I'd say, especially at the leadership level, how you communicate and how you project what you're doing out to your company or to the industry is important. A lot of time we're so busy, we forget to tell others what we're doing. So I think that that's important. And then, you know, we adopted a lot of the, uh, the scrum approach that, you know, we've, I've set up a, my online scrum board of, you know, what I got to do, what I'm doing, what's done. And then what I'm doing is only one thing at once, you know, get, get rid of that multitasking. Oh, that's good. For those who don't know, can you uh, unpack Scrum a little bit? I think that sometimes comes from the software side and getting some products to market, but yeah. how do you, how do you uh, and your team use Scrum? Uh, you use it in a right of ways, but yeah, Scrum comes, you know, agile, agile management from the software side, but it's, it's a way to collaborate as a team around what has to get done. And then it, it breaks far away from the waterfall schedule where everything's sequential and you got to do this, this, and then this. And only one person can do it to where like those scrum boards, you know, here's everything we've got to do. Here's the priority. And then who's doing? And then, well, if someone gets sick, well, we still got to do it. So it, it's easier to, to flip people in and out. And we got our pre-construction teams using it as they go through the pre-construction and design process. We've got construction teams that do it at the kind of trade management level. And then, you know, that someone naturally flows into a lot of the other lean techniques like pool planning and, and waste minimization and things like that that that, that we're adopting. Very cool. So it's more of a behavior, but it's also a very good collaborative tool when you have teams that need to work together around mul- multiple activities. That just makes sense. Sounds like it works really well for, for you guys. So we'll put a link uh, to the Scrum methodology so everybody can read up on that. Uh, so Chad, um, I'm a fan of the bucket list. What are one or two things maybe on your bucket list? Oh boy, I haven't really thought about that one. Any travel, adventure, any... You want uh, to I mean, who yeah, knows? I mean, we want, I want to get to Tahiti one of these days. Kind nice. of been to Hawaii, been to a bunch of other Caribbean, but Tahiti always seems like a nice place. And i will also say Australia is on that list somewhere in the, in the future to get to. Very cool. Uh, that sounds amazing. How about books? Do you like to pick up a good book and hold it in your hands? Do you like to listen to books, Audible or podcasts or trade publications? Just, you know, how, how do you consume, you know, something like, like a book? And then do you have one or two book recommendations? I'd say I do a lot online right now just to keep up with uh, snippets of news just a lot of news feeds that come across so I can quickly then dive into it. I have my, my trade professional magazines and ENR that I keep on my desk and flip through when I'm actually in my office and then books. Yeah. I like, you know, both kind of, uh, when I get free time, I like just science fiction books and, and fantasy books, but don't have one of those right now on my, on my desk or professional. It's, you know, a lot of times it's someone telling me, Hey, did you read this book? You know, what about this book? And I'll just, you know, I'll pick it up and read it. I mean, the several the books, the Two Second Lean is a very quick and easy read. Okay. And it's very uh, understandable on how, how can you quickly adapt lean to your, your team and your behavior. And then um, the, the Scrum book is, you know, do twice the work in, in half the time. Uh, again, it, it kind of takes the Two Second Lean and puts on steroids on, on how you actually adapt, adapt Scrum to your workflow. The, the, we're going to put links to both of those. I, I mean, you're, you're, you know, in the construction world, right? I, I think you guys are being innovative if you're using, you know, lean construction and then scrums. And it's just, it's about, 
not just efficiency, but just you're right, how we communicate, what's really a priority, what should we go after? And there's only so much time in a day. So it's pretty cool that you're doing lean and scrum. And just for those that are listening and in construction, I've just got to totally agree with what, what Chad's way out in front of us. Yeah. Make sure you're taking a look at these books. Fantastic. And uh, I'd say the, the one recommendation I make people is, you know, the, the book is gives you ideas, but you've got to figure out how to change behavior. And that, that's one reason, like two second lean, it, it's not, you're not trying to change the world. You're trying to have a daily discussion on how do I just improve two seconds a day? And it sounds simple, but it's actually really hard to do. But that behavior that you really need to focus on and get done. Totally makes sense. Well, you know, I just kind of want to ask about some career advice or just some words of encouragement. So, you know, Chad, some listening are just now getting into this green building movement. Others might be a little more of a seasoned veteran that needs a, a new spark. So just, is there anything you wish you'd have known a little earlier in your career, uh, A, but B, is just any words of encouragement to someone making a go in this green building movement? I mean, I, I think to me, it's, more about the conversation than I'd say the checklist. We spent a lot of years trying to get a rating or getting a certification and we sometimes miss the conversation that we should have had. So you use everything that you come across as tools and guides, but you know, make sure you're actually understanding what people want and use their don't get hung up on terms. You know, if they say something, don't try and convert them to, well, this is the term you should use. It's like, well, no, that's what they're comfortable with. You know, go with it. And, you know, how do we achieve their vision versus trying to put them in a box? And I think I probably early on, I spent more time trying to put people in boxes than, you know, getting success for them. Wow. Yeah. You've, you've, I'm sure you've had a lot of those uh, experiences over your career and just, uh, I want to say thank you for being on the podcast here. It's an interesting journey from the doctorate and your time in the Air Force, commissioning, family business, and really for the last 14 plus years, just all the great stuff you've done at, at McCarthy. So, uh, Chad, congrats on your successes and thanks for showing us a peek into your journey. Really appreciate being on the podcast. That's been fun. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you to our loyal listeners. We actually are celebrating over one year here on the Green Building Matters podcast. Me and the entire team were stoked and just so glad you continue to listen every Wednesday morning to a new interview with a green building professional here in this industry or just some pro tips that we want to make sure that you are getting straight from us, straight to you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.